So my title is Cryopreservation and Its Future, but I should make clear at the outset that I'm not talking here about human cryopreservation. I'm not talking about cryopreservation of individual tissues or even organs. I'm talking about the more ambitious goal of actually cryopreserving either entire human beings or the bit that really matters, which is up here, the brain. And you've already got some background on that from this afternoon. So I'm going to sort of explain a bit more about how it actually works practically and address some of the philosophical issues that I think might have been part of the disagreement today. And even though I'm from Arizona, it's a little warm in here, so I'm going to be a little less formal. Uh, so cryonics, first of all, my a bit of background of my history with cryonics. Uh, I'm, I, I'm the CEO and president of the Alcor Life Extension Foundation, which is the largest cryonics organization in the world, which is not really saying that much because there aren't very many of us, but still, it's something. Um, I've been a member for over 30 years. I joined back in 1986 when I was still living in England and started the first English cryonics organization. And I'm currently in my seventh year of running the organization. So to me, this is not a job I just took because, you know, because of the salary or anything else. I thought you'd be crazy to do that with this kind of job. I took it because I don't want to die. And my goal is not to be cryopreserved. I want to make that very clear at the outset. Nobody who signed up for cryonics wants to be cryopreserved. They don't want to be floating in a tank of liquid nitrogen, unable to make any decisions. That's really not very pleasant. However, we think, okay, let's consider the alternatives. I can be shoved in a big oven and incinerated. Mm, not so good. I can be put in the ground and I can be munched on by worms and bacteria. Oof, no, not too good either. Okay, I guess cryonics is probably a pretty good option. Will it work? We don't know for sure. Nobody's offering any certainty here. But I will address some points about the evidence for believing it's a reasonable thing to do. Uh, so my goal is to try and stay healthy, to try and live as long as possible. I'm 53 now. I took this job partly because I've been interested in life extension for decades, but in 30 years, we haven't really made a whole lot of progress. We've slightly extended the average lifespan. We haven't even budged the maximum lifespan. So in my late 40s, I was thinking maybe I should make sure this is actually going to work as well as possible. So really, what, what is cryonics all about? In my view, the best way to think about cryonics is that it is an extension of emergency medicine. Now, I think it's very important to put it that way. It's not about doing anything with dead bodies because our patients are not dead. And I think there's a big philosophical issue here and a big problem in that people say, well, the doctor has declared this person dead, so you're freezing dead bodies. No. To explain why that's the wrong way to look at it, let me take you back to 1960. 1960, we didn't have CPR, we didn't have defibrillation, we didn't have many of the techniques we have today for resuscitating people. So, if one of you, if we were back in 1960, one of you suddenly got, uh, fell on the floor and stopped breathing, there's no pulse, we check you, and just like on the original series of Star Trek, that amazingly competent Dr. McCoy, he's dead, Jim. He, he never actually did anything, as far as I can tell, to try and revive people or resuscitate them. So back in 1960, you'd be considered dead. Today, we don't do that, right? We pounce on you, we start doing CPR, defibrillation, various things, and in many cases, we can resuscitate you and you can be perfectly okay. So think about this, in 1960, when someone said, the doctor said, you're dead, were you? Well, not by today's standards. And that's really the point, that today, when we call someone dead, are they really dead? And my answer is no, they're not. But they will be if you don't do something to stop them getting worse. And that thing you can do is called cryonics. You can think of it as kind of a medical time travel, if you like. Today, if something happens to somebody critically, medically, they have a seizure, uh, they have heart failure, something goes wrong, someone comes in an ambulance and they take you from one place to another place, a clinic or a hospital, uh, that can treat you. They take you from a place where they don't have the uh, the equipment and the skills to somewhere where they do have the equipment and the skills to revive you. Cryonics is kind of like that except through time. Basically what we're doing is we're putting you in stasis, we're stopping things from getting worse, and then we're maintaining you in that position, not getting any worse, and we're going to wait until the future, which we think is highly plausible, will eventually develop the ability to not only reverse the condition that killed you in today's sense, that you know, made you majorly dysfunctional, but can also reverse the aging process. After all, what's the point in coming back as a 95-year-old only to have something else give out a few weeks later? So this involves, it's part of life extension. That's why we're called the Alcohol Life Extension Foundation. We're not the alcohol freeze them as quick as we can foundation. 
So death to me, and by the way, as, as Susie said, I actually have a PhD in philosophy, which is a little unusual among cryonicists. A quarter of my doctoral dissertation was on the subject of death. What actually is death? I know it's not when your heart stops beating. It's not when you stop breathing. It's not when blood stops flowing in the brain. It's none of those things, and there's a lot of confusion about that. And so people think that anything that happens after you've been called dead is pointless. Well, they're just wrong, because that's not what death is. Death really is the irreversible loss of information needed to construct, reconstruct your, your brain, basically, your memories, your personality. Now, we don't know exactly where that line law, lies, because we don't know what the exact possibilities are in the future. We can be pretty sure that if you're incinerated, and there's nothing left of you but dust, there's no way you're coming back. There is no conceivable technology that could reverse that. Entropy's gone too far. What if you have a heart attack and nobody finds you for two days, and you're at room temperature? I've got to say, it's looking pretty bad, very, very bad. Could we ever reverse that damage? I don't know. I wouldn't want to be in that position, but I wouldn't want to say for sure, no. There's a tremendous amount of damage. But there's a huge difference between that and an optimal situation in cryonics. The optimal situation in cryonics is where we are right there at the bedside when you are called legally dead. And legal death, remember there's all kinds of death. There's clinical death, there's legal death, there's true death. When the doctor calls you dead, what, they, what are they actually saying? Well, she's really saying, I'm giving up on this person. Maybe I could revive them temporarily. And that's where they have do not resuscitate orders because many people don't want them to, don't want to be forced to be come back to life for a few seconds or a few minutes of, of misery. What's the point? But in many cases, you could actually be revived. And yet they're still just drawing a line and saying this person's dead. So it's kind of arbitrary. Almost everything is still alive. Now you heard talks about organ donation. The person is dead, at least legally, and yet the organs are still alive. Otherwise, they couldn't be donated to somebody and keep them alive. So calling someone dead, don't get too excited about that. That definition changes over time. Our goal is to be there when the doctor says, this person's legally dead because we have to wait for that point right now. It's unfortunate, and I'm hoping eventually the law will change so you can elect pre-mortem cryopreservation. Especially if you have, say, brain cancer that's destroying your brain bit by bit, you don't want to wait until everything gives out because your brain will largely be gone at that point. Uh, so it would be nice if you could actually do this earlier, but right now we have to wait for that point. At that point, as soon as that official declaration has been made, arbitrary as it may be, we can go into action. And what is, what is that action? Well, I have to give a very brief description of it. If you want more detail, I encourage you to go to Alcor's website, alcor.org, A-L-C-O-R.org, and you'll see cryonics at the top, and there's a part on procedures, and it will show you in detail what we do. So it's actually quite a complex set of processes, so I'm just going to simplify. So it starts off really, the first thing is you have to sign up, you have to become a member, which means you have to go through all these contracts and paperwork, uh, which includes lots of pages of disclaimers about what things might go wrong. We do not promise that it's going to work. We don't promise anything at all because that wouldn't be, uh, that wouldn't be uh, honest to do that. There's lots of uncertainties. So you have to go through all that. You have to provide a secure funding mechanism because if we do the whole procedure, we go to a lot of expense and then don't get paid, it threatens the entire organization. And that was what happened in the early days of cryonics, and we learned from that. So let's say that you're, you have cancer and... You know, the doctors are saying, you're, you're really crashing now. You're really coming towards the end. We will send out a team, a standby team, who will, as the name suggests, stand by at the bedside, very nearby. We will have our equipment either in the room or in an adjacent room. This wasn't always the case. Back in the 80s, for instance, if you try to do that, if you try to go to a hospital and say, we want to put our cryonics equipment in the hospital room, they say, you what? No, you don't if they even have a clue what you're saying. Today, things are very different, at least in the USA. They will generally let, let you do that. Um, we have very friendly relationships with hospitals in the Scottsdale area in particular, and they work very closely with us. So the first thing that happens is when legal death has been declared, we move the patient from the bed into an ice bath. We put lots of ice in there, we add water, and we use a device to circulate the icy water around the patient. That's because if you just dump ice on somebody, it doesn't cool them very quickly. You want to circulate it. We then, uh, despite the fact you've just been called dead, what we're going to do is restart everything. We're going to use a mechanical CPR device to pump on your chest to restore circulation. We need to do that because we're going to give you about 16 different medications to protect the cells. Again, kind of similar to what's done in organ donation. We want to keep the cells viable for as long as possible. And for that, we have to have circulation. 
We're also going to restore respiration, and we're going to start monitoring temperature and many other variables. So among the medications, I don't want to go into detail. You can find them on Alcor's website, but uh, obviously things like heparin and uh, sodium citrate to stop the blood from clotting so we can keep the circulation going, antacids, membrane stabilizers. There's a whole cocktail which we're always uh, doing research on. In fact, uh, Chana, who gave a talk earlier, has done some of that research, trying to optimize the medications we use in this part of the procedure. So at this stage, what we're doing is called well, standby, and then stabilization, where we're basically stabilizing the patient, trying to minimize the damage at this point, and then transport. Ideally, what you want to do, if you know your terminal, is move to Scottsdale, Arizona. It's a very nice place to come. Check into a hospice. We've got really friendly hospice there. And that way, there's no delay. We can be there instantly. But we can do standbys at a great distance. We've done them in every state you know, around in the USA. We've done them overseas. We've done cases in Thailand and in China, both of which went actually very well. Uh, it's difficult, though. And in Europe, we're also, we have capabilities. We have a kit, uh, two kits actually stored in England, one in London and one with Cryonix UK. And we're hoping to put one in Germany and or some other part of continental Europe. So we'll have everything here. We don't have to worry about customs. We've done the same thing in Canada. So ideally, you come, to, you come to Scottsdale, otherwise we come to you, um, and then we get you, if it's a remote procedure, we'll first of all we'll do a blood washout and replace the blood with a, uh, basically an organ, uh, organ preservation solution. Uh, if it's a local case, we don't need to do that step. We get, go straight to Alcor. We bring in one of our contract surgeons. We don't have full-time surgeons, not enough cases. And depending on what kind of option you've chosen, whether the whole body or the brain, We'll do something like a median stenotomy, open up the chest, access the major blood vessels of the heart, and then we're going to connect your vascular system to a system of a pump and a chiller. And basically, well, you've already heard quite a few of this from the, the organ preservation talk. We're going to gradually introduce a solution that will be quite toxic if you introduce it at too high a temperature and too high a concentration. So we start off with a low concentration, and as the patient cools down, we gradually raise that concentration until it becomes vitrifiable. Now, you've already heard about vitrification. People colloquially say that we freeze people. Well, actually, we don't freeze people. If we freeze them, then we're doing it wrong. Our goal is to minimize or eliminate ice formation. Ice is nasty stuff that does a lot of damage to cell membranes. It's possible that someone with a lot of ice formation in the brain might be repairable, but we don't want to do that kind of damage unnecessarily. So at that point, we're going to replace the blood and intracellular fluids with a cryoprotectant solution. And we licensed the best one that was available from 21st century medicine that's working on organ cryopreservation. And at that point, we begin the cool down process. Uh, to, to simplify, as it goes in uh, several steps, we end up storing you at, I don't know whether you use Celsius or Fahrenheit in Spain and other countries, but minus 320 Fahrenheit, minus 196 degrees Celsius. Now, at that temperature, in fact, anything below about minus 130 Celsius, you have become a true solid and there is zero metabolic activity. Nothing is going to happen. So whether it's a day or 100 years, it doesn't make any difference. So if someone says, well, cryonics is stupid because have you ever brought anybody back? Well, no, of course we haven't. We can't do that yet. We can't even do that very well with, with organs. That's beside the point. We don't have to bring them back today. The whole point of cryonics is you've been put on hold. Nothing is changing. We can wait 50 years, 100 years for that technology to develop. So that makes very important that we actually can survive for that long. Alcohol, by the way, has been in existence for about 45 years now. So we've got a good track record. We're a nonprofit organization, and we're constructed in terms of our governance and finances for the very, very long term. But I want to quickly come back to uh, the, the evidence for this. Why believe this has any reason to work at all? Well, over the last five or six years, we've been doing CT scans of our neuro patients, those who've decided just to preserve the brain. That doesn't look at things on the cellular level, but what it does tell us is whether we've successfully replaced the fluids and prevented ice formation. We didn't know that before. We could just guess, because we couldn't see inside. But now it turns out that CT scans can be done through the aluminum containers in which neuropatients are kept. And we can show now, we can actually give evidence that under good conditions, we are completely eliminating ice formation in the brain. There are also electron microscope studies of vitrified brain tissue done with a similar protocol that show that everything is intact. The neurons are intact, the neural connections are intact, the neural bodies are there. And if that's where memory is stored, and that's the best knowledge we have about how memory works, then you're still potentially there. We just need to develop the ability to reverse that condition. But so long as that, that is there, uh, you're not dead. There is still enough of you that you might be repaired in the future. Think of it this way. 
There are people who've been in comas for 20 years, 30 years, and eventually come back to consciousness, to return to life. Um, there are people, actually, if you've ever seen the movie Awakenings or read the, the book, there were people with such low dopamine levels, they essentially just froze and were not really aware of anything. And after some decades, when L-Dopa was introduced, they came back to life. And they looked in the mirror, and some of them pretty shocked because 20 or 30 years had gone by, and they went, oh my God, what happened? Well, with cryonics, hopefully it'll be the opposite. If we, do the, if we do this right, we'll repair you, we'll rejuvenate you, and you look in the mirror and say, my God, I look fantastic. Back, you'll be back at your best. So we have electron microscope studies that show that everything is intact. Um, we have other studies, uh, Robert McIntyre and, and his group recently, well, because a couple of years ago now, did some uh, research where they used a combination of vitrification with chemical fixation to prevent dehydration of the brain. The problem with dehydration of the brain is it makes it very hard to get good electron microscope images to show that everything is intact. This actually stopped the contraction and he was able to produce these amazing images which have been published showing that everything is perfectly in place. So given what we know about memory, we can show that under good conditions you're definitely still potentially there. I think also briefly there was a mention of the research with a little nematode, a little tiny worm called C. elegans. Uh, this paper was published, as I think Aubrey mentioned, in his journal, Rejuvenation Research. This is the first time that a whole organism, tiny as it is, has been cryopreserved and not only brought back, but we were able to demonstrate that its memory was intact. We taught it a very simple task. It's not, it's not very bright, it doesn't emit that many neurons, but it has enough to know where to find its food based on chemical gradients. And we're able to show against the controls that it retained that memory through the cryopreservation process. Nobody has done that before. So that's a long way from proving that we can bring people back, but it's showing that in principle, memory can be preserved. And by the way, um, I, I really hope people will be here tomorrow for Greg Fay's talk. Uh, he's got some very interesting results on brain cryopreservation that should really convince any skeptics of, uh, you really need to be there for Greg's talk tomorrow. So I want to make the point that, no, we can't prove that cryonics is going to work because we can't prove the future. It's kind of like in 1900, if you'd said, oh, we're going to eventually land on the moon, well, someone could say, can you prove that? Well, no, but can you prove we can't do it? It doesn't violate any laws of physics. It's not like backwards time travel or faster, time, faster than light travel, which probably impossible unless our physics are badly wrong. This doesn't violate any physical laws. It's just a very difficult technical problem. But difficult technical problems get solved over time. In 1961, let's put a man on the moon within a decade. Well, we can't do that. We don't have the right propulsion systems, life support systems, and this and that. Well, we're going to make it happen, and we did. If we put the same effort into cryopreservation, or both organ research and human cryopreservation, I think there's no reason why this can't be achieved. There's nothing impossible about it. And if someone thinks it is impossible, they're going to have to explain to me their criteria for possibility. Uh, so very briefly, because I'm about out of time here, um, there's a number of issues I won't, I won't cover about how we, how we plan for long-term survival, uh, and that part of our goal is not just to bring you back and push you out of the door and say, good luck. Uh, it's actually part of our mission to help rehabilitate you, get you back into society, just like someone coming back from a coma. So just briefly about the future, uh, since that's part of the title of the talk. What do I see in the future? Well, I see already a growing acceptance of the idea of cryonics in science. I think this conference is an amazing event where we see all kinds of aspects of the general area of the science. And you can see from the context that cryonics really is making a lot of sense now. And we see that from uh, scientific publications. We see it in uh, scientific conferences. We see it in our dealings with hospitals. Like I said, back in the, the 80s, early 90s, we almost never got cooperation from hospitals. Now, instead, they say, oh, I've seen you guys on the Discovery Channel or on that other TV special, and they say, can we watch? Can we help? It's a totally different atmosphere. So I think that uh, we're really going to see a lot more acceptance. We have a, an open letter to scientists, which is signed by dozens of different scientists saying that they think the cryonics is, is, is workable or at least worth researching and trying, and that list is growing and growing and growing. Um, so I think eventually this kind of idea that it's a strange, weird thing will go away. And it's also fitting in with other things that are going on. For instance, this low temperature surgery. Uh, Dr. Peter Ree, who's one of the main pioneers in that field, um, he has taken gunshot wound victims who normally you couldn't operate on because they bleed out too fast. And he's chilled them all the way down to 10 degrees C, which is much colder than any human surgery before. And they get about four times as long to do the surgery. And in animal models, that's brought the 
the uh, success rate from single digits up to around it's of like 90%. And Dr. Reed came to visit Alcor, and of course we were expecting him to say, oh, you're a bunch of crazy people. He said, oh, yeah, this makes perfect sense. This is kind of like what I'm doing, but more radical. And he even said that in the press. So to conclude, you know, so many questions that come up here, I'll, I'll be happy to answer them in the question period. But my conclusion is that cryonics might seem odd today, but at some point in the future, and I can't say when, it will become the norm. Every hospital will have a cryonics unit where once you need it, They'll go into action, and they'll start this, the initial process, and then probably transfer you to a specialist organization. And there will be some day in the future when we look back on today, and we will think, were people insane? They took their loved ones, and they threw them in the ground or in big ovens when they could have cryopreserved them. Those people were crazy back in the early 21st century. Why didn't they cryopreserve them? So I like to take that perspective. I think this should be the normal thing, and I hope people will think about this carefully and become part of that norm. Thank you very much.